This lovely old gal came in for some TLC. It is a 1974 Marshall Mark II 1987 lead. And it's mostly original. You can see here it's had an added master volume and the master volume is even loose. More on that to come. And you can see the master volume pot was mounted in the indicator hole and they just put a new hole here, move the indicator bulb down here. That's not a problem. It kind of looks good. Um, but this is a bad implementation of a master volume. So at the very least, that's getting changed out for a better sounding one that won't be loose. Check all the other pots, make sure they're not loose. Everything else feels good initially. Great cosmetic condition. Even the, the knobs are in good shape. A lot of times these caps fall off and get lost along the way, or these plastic uh, switches uh, shear off, or the uh, metal panel gets all disfigured or the text fades, but this thing's in fantastic shape. All the lettering's nice and clear. Uh, seems to have all the original input jack stuff. Really pretty, really, really pretty. The Tolex is in great shape. The piping's in great shape. Beautiful. Let's flip it around back and take a look. The eagle-eyed among you will notice that I've already removed the screws. That's because I started to do this video and then I realized I was filming it in slow-mo, which was not good. The only thing you're really missing out on here is when I removed the screws, I showed once again that with the number three screw, you use a number three screwdriver. So you don't get the screws all chewed up. Anyway, so I've had a sneak peek in here. Aside from these scratched initials, which say BRB, be, be right back, I suppose. Uh, we're still waiting on that. It's in really good shape. And someone in some shop in 1986 put a sticker on here. I don't like people who put stickers on the backs of amps, even, you know, just regular amps, let alone what it is now a vintage amp. If you have to put a service sticker at all, you put it in an unobtrusive place, please. I'm sure the owner of this amp at some point is responsible for the BRBs that are scratched in seemingly with an awl or something, but nothing we can do about that now. It's all or nothing. Like most of these, the uh, impedance selector switch is missing the little thing. It's probably because the switch goes flimsy over the years. So someone, probably these people, rewired it so the 8 ohm tap goes to this jack, 16 ohm tap goes to this jack, and a beautiful label there. Uh, as long as they did a good job, that's a that's a fine solution for this. Uh, you can see that there's a, a inked dot, a silkscreen dot here where they could have put a selector switch, but they did not. This amp would have been probably 240. I don't know. It comes with, I don't know. It's from what I've seen, it looks like it's original for the most part inside. So maybe it did have 6550s. Might have been US from the beginning and it's just got a changed out power cable. I don't know. It's got a little. Uh, uh, non-factory thing here says 3 amp, which makes me think that beneath this it says, you know, 1.5 amps or 2 amps for UK mains, 240 volt use. I'm not sure, but uh, 3 amp sounds about right. And I will confirm later that that is a 3 amp fuse and that is a 500 amp fuse before I power it on. Um, let's see, uh, there's a faded pencil mark on top where I can just see that it is a 1974. The uh, date code on the daily caps, which seem to be original, uh, say TG. I don't know what that means, but I imagine it's going to correlate to some week of uh, 74 or possibly 73. Uh, the iron is all in good shape. There's a layer of dust over everything, so later I'll remove the tubes and, and clean off the worst of the dust and clean out all the tube sockets. I don't want to make this thing look new, but uh, I don't want dust and stuff down in the tube sockets. So let me pull this out. We'll take a look inside. Because I do not yet have one of those things that lets me slide the camera down smoothly along a track, we'll do this in sections. So it's got the original switches, which seem to be tight, which is good. It's got the moved uh, indicator bulb, but it was done well. It, it's tight on there. It's got a really crappy pre-phase inverter master volume just stuck between the wiper of the treble pot and the input of the phase inverter, and it's loose, as I mentioned. Well, it's doesn't, not as apparent from this side, but I can feel it wobbling on the other side. Feels like the uh, shaft is broken off of the uh, pot itself. Uh, I'm not surprised the owner's not very happy with that. Here you can see a mixture of original things. 
and spliced things. I don't know why things are spliced, and there's a lot of excess wiring we'll get to in a bit. Seems to be the original fuse holders. And the caps that I can see don't have any big obvious bulges in them, but that does not mean that they're any good at this point. If they're from 1974, they're just a little bit younger than I am, and I could certainly use a fresh start in life. Let's see how they do. You can see all this excess wire here for the output stuff. That's probably just a matter of needing to uh, redo it neatly and bundle it up the way it ought to be, but it sure looks a little bit ugly. And uh, given the uh, solder joint here, which looks non-original, I think this amp probably originally was for 240, has been changed to 110. Supporting that would be this change resistor in the bias supply, and these two change resistors here, not very well changed in this case, the phase inverter uh, grid leaks or uh, bias leaks going to the grids of the output tubes. Other than those three changes, probably to accommodate the change in wall voltage with 6550s, everything seems just fine there, and everything else in the circuit seems to be original. Um, I will find out how it sounds soon, but even if it sounds okay, I would urge the owner to let me at least change the bias caps here. Uh, these are crucial. If these fail and something goes wrong, you can lose, at the very least, a very expensive pair of RCA 6550s, if not damaging an output transformer or something. So it's a fairly cheap insurance to keep this thing working as it ought. And if I do ch pull the, the board up to change those two, I would want to change this cathode bypass cap here, even though it's not going to cause any major problems uh, as far as you know damaging anything if something goes wrong. It's just the channel won't sound its best. There's a lot of scorching in the area between the tube sockets, as if something went dreadfully wrong a long time ago, which might explain why this wiring had to be redone. I don't know. Uh, maybe some the the splices are from things which burned. Uh, I can't really see right now with all the stuff in the way, and I can't really show you on camera right now just due to sh how shadows work. But uh, I will investigate that and report back. All right, you can just see down here that there used to be a bottom. This amp used to have bottom mounted output tube sockets, and has a scorched area here, and now it has top mounted output tube sockets and they're even using different holes than they originally did. Um, that's not in itself problematic, but the screen grid resistors, which you can't see because of all the spaghetti, are mounted really close to everything on the socket, really down in there. Everything's very tight, uh, cramped, a lot of wires where they should not be. The lead dress is kind of horrible. Um, I would really like to rebuild the output section and redress everything. Um, not necessarily necessarily change the tube sockets. There's nothing wrong with the top mounted socket in this case, but it can be done better. And I think it should. I think there are benefits to that. And I'm not trying to make money off the client. I'm trying to protect their uh, very rare and wonderful amplifier because things went south before and it looks like it had kind of a patch job uh, by someone who didn't think anyone would ever look at what they were doing. And it's not just cosmetic. This stuff matters as far as uh, performance and noise and reliability and keeping things away from things which get hot. And if you remember earlier, I said that the hardwired 8 ohm and 16 ohm jacks are fine if they did it well. I don't think they did it well. Those are some terrible solder joints and the lead dress is bad and yada yada. We can do better and I think the amp deserves better. So before I even power it on, I want to talk to the owner. I would feel better if this amp had new filter caps. So not that expensive. It's not a horrendous thing. These original dailies would get returned with the amp, you know, whatever. But I'd love to have a clean slate and knowing that this amp is not only sounding its best, but it's not going to have some issue develop down the road six months from now and need an awful lot of work after he already has me do all this stuff to clean everything up. It just would make sense to me to get those uh, filter caps changed out, get all the lead dress sorted out, all the wiring sorted out, all the solder joints good, uh, screen grids mounted enough off the tube sockets that they're not going to be subjected to heat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
But, you know, if the owner doesn't want me to do all that, that's fine. I'll change out the master volume as we discussed to make sure it's biased correctly. And we can just cross our fingers that that'll be the last service it needs. But with uh, 1974, so that's 50 year old, uh, 49 year old caps, it's, it's time to change them. No tone will be lost in the process, I promise everyone. 